<clears throat> Second Samuel chapter 24. We are going to be touching on a number of scriptures. I won't give them to, give them to you. There are too many. So that um, as we go along, you don't need to turn to it. Most of them, you would already know them because they've been used here quite frequently. Still getting a... Second to Samuel chapter 24, reading from verse 18. <clears throat> we all there? No, we are not all there. Okay, if you can't find Samuel, it should come up on the board, so you just follow me there. And God came that day to David. And incidentally, before we go on, you know, you may be wondering, who is God? It's not another way of saying God. <laughs> God was a prophet of God. Okay? <clears throat> and God came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aurora looked and saw the king and his servants coming towards him. And Arona went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arona said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Arona said unto David, Let my lord the king take and, off, take and offer up that what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, and the threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arona as a king Give unto the king, and Arona said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Arona, Nay. Did I miss out something? Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God, of that which that cost me nothing. No, I am not going to take it for free. I am going to purchase it from you. For I will not offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that which that cost me nothing. Let me give you the background of this account. The background is that David took a census of his army contrary to what God would have wanted him to do. He numbered the soldiers so that he could know the soldiers that he could depend upon in time of war, the number being 1,300,000 1, men. This displeased God. It displeased God because David, in so doing, was now relying on the strength of his army rather than relying on God's faithfulness and the power. There's a big message there for all of us. Put another way, he was glorying in human ability and great numbers rather than in the power and righteousness of God. God was displeased. And through the prophet Gad, he gave David three options to choose from as a way of punishment. We're not going to those options. David's choice resulted in Israel being smote with pestilence, resulting in the death of 70,000 men. In our text, from verse 18, God now comes to David and said, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite, who, if we go down to first. Chronicles, he's also known as Onan. And David comes to Arona and offers to buy the threshing floor to build an altar to offer sacrifice unto the Lord 
so that the plague may be stayed from the people. Arona offers the threshing floor in addition to oxen for burnt offerings, free of cost to David. And David said, no, but I will surely buy it from you at a price. And then he went on to make a very profound statement. He says, neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing. This morning, I want to title this message with a a like profound statement. And it is this. And I want you to hold on to it. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. I want to say it again. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. And you will be hearing this right through the message this morning. Because I wanted to get deep into us and realize that God did not send Jesus Christ to Calvary for his people to play church. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. David's statement to Arona was a demonstration of how much he valued his relationship with God. And every child of God should value, should value their relationship with God such as David did. That they would do, that they would not attempt to do anything that would not bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love for mankind in a similar way. We heard about it this morning. He sacrificed his only begotten son for sinful man so that man can have a relationship with him. What Jesus did there was make the eternal sacrifice. David had to use oxen and wood and the fire to make a sacrifice to God. We don't have to do that. God sent his son into the world to make the eternal sacrifice once and for all, his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus made the eternal sacrifice by offering his life so that mankind who will accept him as God's gift to them can be reconciled to God. I don't know if Tommy was around me when I was preparing, but he said some things that I have I make mention of here. It was through this very costly sacrifice that Christianity was born into the world, and it is the only means by which man will ever see the face of God. Amen. We have got a lot of religions in the world today each one having their own conception of God. But I'm here to reinforce the fact that you already know that there is only one way to God, and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. I challenge any other religious folk, whatever they may claim their God, whatever name they may call their God, it is not the same God if you can go to him outside of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? You can call him by whatever name you want. You can declare he's the creator of the heaven and the earth. You can declare that he created all things. You can bow down to him and worship him 24-7, 367 days a week, a year. If there is another day coming up. But if you are not going through the man, Christ Jesus, to this God, you're not worshiping the same God of this Bible. And the God of this Bible is the God that created the heavens and the earth. 
As Christians, we must understand and come to terms with the fact that in order to live for Christ, uh, listen to me please this morning, in order to live for Christ, a price will have to be paid. It is going to cost us. Anyone want to come to Christ and expect a free willy? It's not going to happen. If you really want to know this Christ, if you, we really want to serve this Christ, if we want to get the benefits of what Christ did at Calvary for us, it's going to cost us something. Because he paid a very, very deep, dear price to bring us into the, the kingdom. So that Christianity, that costs nothing, is worth nothing. We live in an age of what I will call, for want a better word, cheap Christianity. The world has taken on a form. And when I say the world, I'm talking about the church world. It has taken on a form of cheap, very, very cheap Christianity. Mind you, not that there is such a thing. No, there is no such thing. It is how Christianity is being promoted today in a very cheap way. There's no cheap Christianity. The price has been too great. Let me give you an example. Let me start with who. Last week I sat in front of the television. Can't remember what day it was. And I saw in a place that looked like the Savannah. If it wasn't Queen's Park, it must have been some opening like a Savannah. And what was taking place, there was supposed to be a Christian rally. And I could tell no difference, absolutely no difference between what was supposed to be praise and worship, what was supposed to be a praise and worship segment, as against any Calypso carnival calypso event in the savannah. I could not tell any difference. The people that is supposed to be a congregation were just like people in a carnival celebration. The performers, and I call them performers, they were supposed to be praise and worshippers. But they had to be performers and performers only. Because you could not tell the difference between any one of them and a Calypsoan in the savannah at carnival time. A Calypsoanian. Complete with gyrating of bodies. and I mean, it was so sickening. And the people were there waving their kerchiefs or whatever they give them to wear. It was just like a carnival. And I remember that time, the very first year that I was saved. I went to a Morris Serolo convention in LA. Morris Serolo being a great man of God and all that, miracles working through him. For the five days we sat under him, it was just glorious. The presence of God. We saw miracles taking place. But at the conclusion, when Morris Serlo left the platform, everything turned old mask. I could not tell the difference. I was a masquerader for many, many years. And I could not tell the difference of what was taking place there as against what I knew to be carnival. And it grieved my spirit. I backed off gradually get to the very back of the thing, and I cried out to God, God, what's happening? And the Lord said, see how easy the soul, can, the flesh can override the spirit. For five days, it was all spirit. And that last day, the flesh took over and overrode the spirit. Today, in North America, you have churches on reality TV. Have you ever seen that? Pastors gone wild. 
Pastors in LA. Those are titles of the reality programs, and you would not believe what transpires in those th um, programs. What is known as praise and worship, as a praise and worship band in North America today, is no different from a rock band in the world. The music is no different. The supposed worship leaders are nothing but performers who are no different, and the congregation are hip with it. And this is the claim. We have to be like them if we want to reach them. I have never heard so much hogwash in all my life. When I go into the scriptures, I don't see Jesus becoming like the people of the world so that he could reach the world. I see Jesus as set apart from the world. And when I read my Bible, it tells me that that's what I have to do. I have to come apart. I can't be like them. But this is what's happening in the church world today. God's word says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. I mean, it is so clear. How can we become like the world? The worldlings, the people who have never experienced Christ's redemption power within them, doing the things that are contrary to the word of God. And we must become like them so that we can win them? How about letting them see God in us so that they would want God? When a person can do what they want, say what they want, wear what they want, and it happens in Christendom. It happens in Christendom. Wear what they want. Wear what the world wears. Look at what they want, behave in which way they want, no matter how contrary it is to the word of God, could we justifiably call ourselves Christian? I said justifiably because we all call ourselves Christian. My understanding of being a Christian is one who follows Christ, who applies the word of God to their lives, allowing the spirit of Christ to develop the Christ life in them so that they can live that life that others may see the Christ in us. This is my understanding of what a Christian should be. Now, we don't all get there at the same time. No one of us gets there at the same time. But progressively, this is what should be taking place in our lives. More and more, we should be exemplifying the life of Christ. And it's revealed in his word. We must be exemplifying that life, no matter what situation we may be in, where we may be, who we may be around, what influences are coming our way, we must be exemplifying the life of Christ. This is my understanding of Christianity. My word tells me, let my light so shine about all men so that others will see and know and glorify God the Father. That's my understanding. And I can't be wrong because it is recorded in the word of God. Romans 12, 2 tells us that we are not to be conformed to the world. We are not to be conformed to the world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that we are to be conformed into the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29. For this to be so, this doesn't happen automatically. Though we have got the Spirit of God in us to help us get there, it does not happen automatically. Be 
ye transformed. There is something that we have to do. We have got to change our thinking. We have got to change our behaviors. We have got to change our attitudes. We have got to put right everything that's wrong in our lives. Only then we would be transformed. It's not an automatic thing. It's a progressive thing. But the problem is that when we are Christians for a number of years and there is no change in our lives, how can we really say that we are Christians who are allowing the Christ life to develop into us so that we can live the Christ life? For us to be transformed and for us to be conformed to the image of Christ, a price has to be paid. It will cost us something. We cannot, well I shouldn't say we cannot because people do, but we should not continue in our old ways forever, not ever wanting to change. And at the same time, when we come into the house of God, we lift our hands to worship and praise Him. It's not going to work with God. He said, Jesus said, These people glorify me with their lips. Howbeit their hearts are far removed from me, howbeit in vain, in vain do they worship me. It's going to cost us. Why? Because Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Not to be conformed to the world and be transformed by the ring of the mind is a sacrifice that has to be made. It's a sacrifice. As I said before, it's not an automatic thing. It's a constant warring against the indwelling sinful nature that we all have and will be with us for the rest of our lives. We have got to war with that nature. Added to that, we have to war against the powers of darkness which seeks to influence the sinful nature within us by using every and any means at their disposal. Your own families. Friends, church members, the devil will use just about anyone to tickle us, that nature in us, so that we would rise up and behave in an ungodly way. We have to war against the influences of the world so as not to be contaminated with them, by them. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit of God in us. Thank God, for we could never do any of those things unless we had the help of God. But even with the help of God, there's a part we have got to play. There is a part we have got to play. It is not just a matter of accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior, coming to church and continuing to live our lives the same way. No, that's not Christianity. That's churchianity. That's one step away from religiosity. Churchianity. But Jesus Christ came so that we can live a life that could be considered Christianity. Christ life like. Christ like life. This is the life that Christ has come that we might live. Who we yield ourselves as servants to obey, Romans 6.16 tells us. Who we, you, me, yield ourselves as servants to obey, his servant we are to whom we obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto Righteousness, Romans 6, 16. So we have got a part to play. Yes, we have got the Holy Spirit urging us on. 
through the Word of God, through the preaching of the Word of God, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God within us, through His conviction upon us, through the illumination of His, all that the Holy Spirit is doing. But we have got a part to play. We have got to yield. We have got to yield. To whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey. His servants you are, whom you obey. Because human nature is what it is, we are prone to be led by the flesh. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's not fool ourselves. Because of the sinful nature that is in us, we are more prone to be led by the flesh and not by the Spirit. In order... To avoid that, in order to avoid being led by the flesh, we have got to overcome the flesh. We have got to fight against this sinful nature, not this flesh, this sinful nature that is in us. We have got to fight against it. And until such time that we overcome that nature, step by step, degree by degree, we are not going to be able to be led all the way by the Spirit of God. We must, we must subdue that old man within us so that the Spirit of God can lead us. What I am saying, in effect, is all this costs us. There's a price to be paid. See this thing called self? To put self down, to take self off the throne and put Christ on the throne of our heart, it costs us. Not dollars and cents, mind you, but it costs us taking a stand for Christ against our flesh. And if you are truthful, you would know that that's no easy thing to do. There is a price A sacrifice, a sacrifice that has to be made so that we can walk in the ways that God would have us walk. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What do we understand by that? Let us deny ourselves. Denying self means surrendering one's will to God. God does not interfere with our wills. But we can surrender our will to God. If the old man within us is driving us to do something that is contrary to what God says we should do, and we choose not to obey that flesh, but to do what God says, what we have actually done is surrender our will to God. In other words, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. So that denying self means surrendering one's will to God. It means if he says to do something, we do it no matter what the cost. These are words that I am speaking, but listen to me. This can cause a lot of pain. It can cause a lot of hurt. What about you fall in love with someone? That someone can make all the difference in your life. It can make all the difference in your life. All your problems will be resolved or solved just by having that someone in your life. But that someone is not born of the Spirit of God. And you know that someone for quite a while. And someone is doing just everything right. For you. The day will come when you have got to make a choice. 
The day will come when you have to surrender your will to God or do it your way instead of thy will be done, my will will be done. And it's going to cost you. It could be painful. It could be painful. But let me tell you this morning. When our wills are surrendered to the Lord, no matter what it costs us, in the long run, it's going to pay high, high dividends. Very, very high dividends. We may not see it now. But in the long run, it will pay very, very high dividends. Dividends. That's what Paul says. Not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. He surrendered his will to God. And this is what Jesus meant when he says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Self is a very, very powerful thing within us. Very, very powerful. It can drive us to do things that will make Jesus cry. If we don't put restraint on self. And this is why I keep saying to you, Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Calling yourself a Christian and doing everything that you feel you want to do, if it looks right, you do it. If it feels right, you do it regardless of what God's word says. That's not Christianity. It's not costing you anything. It means surrendering one's affection, our body, our soul to God. Not seeking our own happiness. Hello? You look like the disciples when Jesus said, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no... You look like you're ready to leave. Not seeking your own happiness. Not seeking your own happiness and pleasures at the expense of obedience to the word of God. This is what it means by if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. This is not a hard word, you know. This is a required word. This is what Jesus says. So it means surrendering one's affections, our own body and soul to God, not seeking our own happiness and pleasures at the expense of obedience to the word of God. He says that we are to take up our cross daily and follow him. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Matthew 10, 38, he says, And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. If we just want to go along like Hop Along Cassidy doing whatever we want, you don't know who is Hopalong Cassidy. You'd be born in my time to know that. <laughs> it's not like that, loved ones. No. It's not like that at all. Thank God we have a God who is long-suffering, who is merciful, who is faithful, who is gracious. But you know, we can't take that for granted and continue for the rest of our lives being the same way because we will never really come into the fullness of Christ and enjoy the full benefits of Christ. I think it was Paul who prayed that prayer that Christ may be fully formed in us. That's what it is all about. So, this kind of Christianity will cost us. We have got to make sacrifice. We have got to sacrifice our own selves, the self-life, to live the Christ life. We have got to put the old man down so that the new man in Christ can rise. And it takes sacrifice. Tell me if this doesn't cost. Jesus in Matthew 16, 25. 
He says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is he talking about? We must all go and be martyrs for Christ. No, you can't be a martyr unless the Lord leads you into that. You can't go and do stupidness and say you're a martyr for Christ. What Jesus is speaking of here is the self-life. Except you lose that self-life, you would not find life. Whosoever will save his life, self-life, shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life, self-life, for my sake, will find it. We have got to make, understand that it will cost us something. It will cost us putting to death uh, this self-life. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Jesus in Mark 5.11 Blessed are you. Blessed you are. When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Is that nice? Is that nice? To be accused wrongfully. For people to say all kinds of things against you falsely. Persecuted you. Reviling you. No. God requires that we hit back at them. <laughs> if they do you, do them back. Make yourself feel good. Is that what Jesus says? No. no. Hear what he says. Rejoice. I tell you it will cost you. <laughs> Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted the prophets that were before you. When I read this text. I realize I am a blessed man. The amount of persecution I have had to endure and false things said about me and still is being said about me. I think I told you this before and I started the song excited already. You know, I get excited when those things happen. Really, somebody tell me, you weird boy. It excites me. I don't know. It must be the help of the Holy Spirit. But it excites me. You say anything bad again, it excites You know why? Because I know what God is saying about me. I am making sure about what he says about me. Tell me if it doesn't cost. Love your enemies. <laughs> Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. What happens when somebody curses you? What is the first feeling that comes to you? Tell me. Not curse them back. Well, it's not curse here, it's curse. It doesn't mean the same thing. But let's use curse. Because not every day we have people cursing us. Okay? What is, this, what is the first thing that rises up within you? Yeah, that's right. You want to do it back. But in order not to do it, you have to restrain this self within you. That's the price that you are paying to walk in obedience to the word of God. It's a price to be a true Christian. There is a price to be a true Christian. Because Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. It doesn't have to be your enemy, you know. Your friend, your husband, 
your wife, your children. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. You know they hate you. How you know they hate you? Because they're doing spiteful things against you. They're hitting you left, right, and center. They're killing you with their tongue. That's how you know they hate you. And in spite of all this, Jesus is saying, do good to them. Tell me if that doesn't cost us. I know some of you are broken. You can't pay that price. <laughs> but if you work out your salvation, <laughs> you will get pay and you will be able to finance this thing. <laughs> Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And listen to what Jesus says. Why you must do that? Verse 45. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven that you may is one good thing to say I'm a father child <laughs> it's another thing to reflect his life so that you can truthfully say I am a child of my father I didn't say it look at it here Genesis Matthew 5 verse 44 Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45, that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. I want this to seep into our spirits because we are going to be facing all kinds of things in this life. But God has not left us defenseless and helpless. He has given us his word and he has given us his spirit. We can do it. We could get to the finish line. We could run the race and get the prize. Let me see by a raise of hands who likes suffering. Let me see. <laughs> Nobody likes the suffering. Suffering is not a nice thing. Who could ever like his suffering? But there are times when we do suffer things at the hand of, hands of others, not so? When that happens, what do we want to know? Why God? Why did you allow have you ever said that before? Lord, why did you allow this to be? Why did you allow this to happen? One of these days I'm going to talk about, I'm going to preach specially on that. Why God allows. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. This is the word of God. 1 Peter 2.20 For what glory is it when you are buffeted for your faults and shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. <laughs> you see what he accepts? When people beating up on you and saying all kinds of things against you and doing everything wrong against you and you take it patiently, that's acceptable to God. Do you understand why I'm calling the message Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing? 
Listen to verse 21. For even unto were we called. This, for the same reason we were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Suffering will come. And we have got to take it patiently. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. It will cost you your time. It will cost you your time. Time is precious. Your time is precious. But God requires some of that time for his glory and for his kingdom. So that when you sit in church on a Sunday morning, you are sacrificing this time. You could be doing other things, not so? But you are sacrificing this time. But then that comes like a norm. Let's talk about prayer meeting. That's where the sacrifice comes now. That's where it's going to cost you some time. Just an hour and a half. But you are developing your Christianity because prayer is a vital aspect of the Christian life. Not so? And we are not just talking about individual prayer. We are talking about corporate prayer now. You know, there's a message I need to preach sometime called the effectiveness of a prayer. I've been looking at it. The effectiveness. We think that every time we open our mouth to God, that he's going to respond. Huh? No. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. The effectual. It must be effective. And I'll tell you one day how that prayer can be effective. So it will cost you time. Time to give of your own spiritual development. Time to give for your own spiritual development. Time for the development of God's kingdom. We're talking about prayer meetings here. He says we must seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's going to cost us some time. It's going to cost us time. Are we willing to give of that time to the kingdom of God? Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. When God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and we are seeking everything first for ourselves, you know what he says through James? We ask and we receive not because we want to consume it upon the lust of our flesh. We ask amiss. We miss God. We can go on and on through his word and Cutting it now because time is up. We don't want to be just professing Christians. We don't want to be just professing Christians. The world is filled with that kind. We want to be Christians according to the word of God. Biblical Christians, if I may use that term. We want to be biblical Christians. If you read the newspaper, you look at the news, especially the world news, you would hear what's happening in Sudan and how many Christians are being killed. You know what they call Christian? Anybody who is not a Muslim is a Christian. They don't understand what Christianity is all about. They don't understand that one has to be born of the Spirit of God. They don't understand that one has to accept Christ as their Savior and live the life of Christ. So anything. Do you know that the Jehovah Witnesses call themselves the real Christians? Yes. They call themselves the real Christians. But they do not believe that Christ is God come in the flesh. What you call that an oxymoron? (laughs) 
it will cost you your money. Three amen. <laughs> it will cost you your money. It will cost you your money. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Malachi chapter 3, God says, not Banfield. God says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat. And prove me this day if I will not rebuke the devourer for your sake. And it goes on and all the... <clears throat> it's on the board. Oh, good. Good. Very good. <laughs> It'll cost you. What are tithes and offerings for? For the building up of the kingdom of God. And if we think we have, well, we have enough people here and we already have our church... This is not the kingdom of God, loved ones. This is a house that God has given us to worship him in. And when I say give us, uh, he didn't say, hey. <laughs> it costs yeah. to even function. Oh, you don't have a clue about that. But so many of, us, so many of you, you come and you just take it for granted. But this is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is universal. We can't save the world. No one organization can save the world. But when God sends us into a place to do a thing, if you belong to the earth, then you are involved. You should be involved. So then we all should be involved in what God has sent us. Well, you know what this ministry is about in a place like India with one billion Hindus, Muslims, less than one percent Christian. You think Jesus didn't die for them? And the people that would come to Christ don't have the resources to even hear about Christ. And this is why God wants us to do things like gender save. How many of you have contributed to gender save? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. The Bible says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Don't raise your hand, but exercise your conscience. We talk about gender save. Babies are being killed because they are born female. Killed because they are born female. And the government is not doing anything about it. It's not happening in Trinidad, it's happening in India. How is God going to help? He's going to use his people. Are we his people? Yes. yes. But when we talk about gender saving them, you're not making a contribution to that. You're not paying your tithe. What kind of Christianity is that? Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Let us be true children of God. Let us exemplify Christ with our lives. Let us put down the fight against, war against the old man. Allow the Christ life to live through us. It will cost us. It will be painful. We have to make sacrifice. But as I said before, Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. David was offered the trash and floor. He was offered the implements of the trash and floor. He was offered the oxen free of charge. And he says, no. No way. I will not offer burnt offerings unto the Lord if it costs me nothing. What are we offering to the Lord this morning? All he wants of us is our hearts. That's all. Offer him your heart. And this doesn't mean, Lord, here is my heart. Take it. It means in every situation and every circumstance where the flesh wants to rule over the spirit man, that you're going to pull the 
spirit man, the, 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 the flesh down and allow the spirit man to rise. This is offering the Lord your heart. That's all he wants. Faithfulness. Obedience. Walking in his ways. Not just being hearers of the word, but being doers of the word as well. So he that had ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying this morning. Not me, what the Spirit of God is saying. And understand, Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. And if you are not prepared to pay the price, you are not being the kind of Christ-like person that God has called us to be. God bless you richly. You may be stand. You may stand.